years in a very small scale. And I used to think, you know, I have something I should do. So I used to be very close to him. And he's still alive, doing a small business, still he's on the same level, which used to be about forty years back. And I thought I should start doing interiors, started with the furniture making initially. I started with the table, still I remember, it was hundred rupees. First, first table which I… that was the beginning of my business. This is I'm talking about forty, forty-one years back. Um, so, and then, you know, when I came here, I… my first visit to, to Muscat, I went to Intercontinental uh, Hotel which was under construction, they were doing the finishing. I looked at the ceiling, I was shocked. I've never seen anything like that in my lifetime. So I was thinking to myself, how do I relate to an environment which is completely, probably, I'm from the seventeenth century walking into twenty-fifth century. That was… A, that was… The, I can clearly remember all that. And you know, the, those days, you know, the workers used to come from Lebanon to put… fix the ceiling. It was a simple ceiling, it was a simple ceiling. We are, I've never seen it in my lifetime, I've never seen it in any project in India. So the challenges were, were so difficult because even lack of knowledge, no capital, new environment, new geography. What's the secret then? I mean, you speak about quality. What differentiates you to anybody else? Or is it See, quality for me, I think you are born with that, I think. I don't know whether… It, I don't know whether somebody can develop a quality feeling. Anything that I do, the first thing is to make sure that it is the best. It is not an ego, definitely not an ego. It is something, you know, which is my requirement that I have to be the best. Whichever country I have operated, I have become the… I have become the best. Even… Uh, even India today, uh, even though we are… we are one of the top four companies in the country in India. But as a quality brand, the brand… there was a re recent study by a brand study uh, which they… That we are the, we are number one brand in the residential sector of the whole country. So quality is, I think it comes within the person and work work towards it. And it cannot be, it, to me, to me, I, th I don't think it can be developed. So when you think of a, of a development, what are the critical things that you look at? You have a formula of twenty-eight or, or thirty items that you have to… Can you give us a, a little… Uh, insight into those uh, thirty items and you said plumbing was one and, and quality of… you know, the, those kinds of things. In the what building industry, in the building industry, there are about… approximately about twenty-eight activities. <coughs> According to me, the critical activities where you can have a lot of problems from the customer is the wet services, where the water goes. You know, water goes in the plumbing line, air conditioning line, fire lines, wherever the in and out. Unless you make a… make sure of the quality of the work that you create and the design and quality, design is also equally critical to make sure that it's a successful project when you commission a building or when you hand over a building, it's, a, it's not that simple. So for me, the biggest… biggest… the most difficult area is wet services. Okay. And… and that's something that you are personally very, very careful I… About. I… even today, yeah. even today if you really ask me, day in and day out, there is a lot of emphasis. I say that water is an enemy to the industry, okay. building industry. Treat that enemy very properly. It could be architectural detail problem, it could be waterproofing, it could be concrete problems, it could be plumbing problems, it could be mechanical problems like, you know, uh, the hot water, I mean the chiller lines. All these things over a period of time could bring in leakage in the building. Let's talk about scaling. Uh, your first million dollars was at the… by about 1984 and then suddenly uh, the, uh, the acceleration happened. Can you talk about your first project, first big project, uh, something which was outside your comfort zone? By the way, do you get outside your comfort zone regularly or you don't? Sorry. I mean, do you get outside your comfort zone? Do you do things which are beyond your capacity? Generally, you know, I stick to my… my… this thing. I'm… I'm… I'm not a social person. I don't… I'm not in a social gathering most of the time, not that I don't go out at all, but eighty percent of my time is spent on my… or ninety percent of my time is spent on my business and business thinking. I don't do anything else. Right. I'm an early bird. I get about, about four o'clock in the morning normally, when I… especially when I exercise. 
and I go to sleep by 10 o'clock. Right. So, um, during the, I think I'll, sp I'll say that 90% of my time is mostly spent on my business. Thinking, thinking, it's not necessary that I should be in front of a table or in the office. I can be sitting in the bed at three o'clock in the morning, I get up and I start thinking this, that, this, that. A lot of ideas come at that point of time. Yes, um, most people, successful people that mm. I've met, they, they daydream. Yeah. They close their eyes and they imagine. Ah, that's it, that's Do you it. visualize things? I think uh, it happens. Yeah. I think that's the, one of the reasons of success too. So again, first big project, really, really big project. Uh, <coughs> when was that? Well, what do you remember? And what was your thought process when you were building that? I did a palace for His Majesty Sultan Gabus. Uh, I would say that, my, that was the most, that's a dream project for me. Um, I'll tell you a small example because, uh, you know, in the palaces, uh, there is plaster of Paris work, uh, which is gilded and decorated. Those days, the decorators used to come from Europe. So I used to do the plaster of Paris work and the people from Germany, uh, they used to come, 60 girls used to come from Germany, used to gild the, uh, the cornices, the molds, etc., etc., the columns, the pilasters, all that. And then, um, this is one thing, you know, which, is, which has excited me in my life. I used to look at this and I said, my God, yeah, why can't we do it? So, I, I told uh, the head of the one in Muscat in those days, that why can't we do it? He had a hearty laugh. Uh, he said, Mr. Man, and you do a good plaster Paris job and this is not done by uh, Indians, it's kind of primarily done by the Europeans and it, they have a history of doing it for the last 200 years and it is not one done by Indians. I said, okay. Then there was a German lady who was doing the, who was the, her name is, uh, I forget her name now. Anyway. So I requested her, I called her for a meeting to my office, I said, why don't we partner? Mm -hmm. So uh, I said, why should I partner with you? Because what's the value addition? I said, I cannot tell you the value addition straight away now. But I can tell you it will make a lot of difference if you partner with me. She said, Mr. Menon, I don't think it makes any sense for me. <laughs> and she went off. So what I did was, I had a painter, an uh, Indian painter with me who used to work with me. I sent him to Germany for training, to how to gild. He was extraordinary, extraordinary talent. And he learned within one week how to gild and he came back. And I created a team of four more artists and created a team of five people. So I go back to this person again. I am ready to do a little bit of work. Can you give me a job? He said, Mr. Wen, please don't talk. Please get back to your work, which you're very strong, you do only that. So, so finally what happened was, I was doing his house. I was doing his personal house, it was not a palace. Of course, palatial decoration, etc., etc. So we did the plaster price. So I asked him, excuse me, can I do one room? Mr. Manager, you've been missing away. I said, if you do not like it, I'll paint it back in white color and give it back to you so the others can come and decorate it. And I, I decorated it. And he couldn't believe what he saw. That was the entry into the decorative uh, work of the palaces. I used to do the gypsum plaster woodwork, paneling, everything, everything I used to do. But decoration work I never used to get. First opportunity I got to, to do the, the thing. And uh, he said, I want the strength for you. Because 60, 100 people come. I said, that you should not worry. Now you know that I can do it. So the tender was quoted. Uh, I do not know the, re I remember the right numbers. Um, suppose it is hundred, hundred dollars. Uh, Angela, Angela his name, Angela quoted uh, two hundred dollars. I quoted hundred dollars and took the job. And in hundred dollars, sixty dollars was the problem. <laughs> so, Angela said, how can this man do it, you know? And I completed before schedule. Then second job also I took, because you know, tendering, and Angela was the only person who used to tender. So second person entered me. Then after about two jobs, Angela came running back to me and said, uh, Mr. Manon, why don't we join? I said, no value addition. 
Okay. So these are just small stories of life, you know, which which is but these are like this. I have about few few more stories, you yes. know, which yeah, which is very interesting. More, tell us one or two more stories yeah. because I think that's uh, life is a combination of memories and stories, yeah. and I think that is really what it is. Mm. But let's get back to uh, because a lot of people here are from the property industry, from the finance industry, and and they know that you are probably a very hard negotiator, and you're a numbers man. What's the formula there? What are you looking for when it comes to return numbers when you're planning out a project? See, generally I'm very keen on one thing. When I do business, so I, I would love to talk about my social responsibility. Half of my wealth goes to charity. I will say social responsibility. <laughs> so, at the same time, when you give half of your wealth, you're also very careful about your business. Business means business. There's no social responsibility. You divide, you know, when I go to my social responsibility, I behave very differently. In my business desk, I behave very differently. If it does not make business sense for me, I will not touch that business. And it generally, it does not take more than ten minutes to understand whether this works or does it work. Till today. Tomorrow I do not know. You walk around with a calculator in your pocket? I work with them. Is there one in your pocket right now? Yeah, there is a yeah. calculator. <laughs> <laughs> what is <laughs> <laughs> I generally, because this is the only time I leave this calculator is when I go to sleep. Yeah, but even when you're sleeping, it's on the side of your it's bed. side of the bed. And, and, and Shobhaji would be very upset, you know, why is this thing there? <laughs> one side Shobhaji, one side uh, calculator. She's used to it now, <laughs> because we've been married for thirty-seven years. We'll be completing thirty-seven years in the month of uh, May in 2015. So, I always say everything is a number in life. You tell me anything, I can tell relate with a number. If it's a time, it's a number. If it's a height, it's a number. If it's a weight, it's a number. If it's a quantity, it's a number. If it's a length, it's a number. Width, is a number. Everything is a number. Volume is a number. It's, a, it's all numbers. Life is full of numbers. People don't understand. So numbers are extremely important. Unless you have sharp, this is my belief, huh? because they all are businessmen here. My belief, strong belief is that unless you're very good in numbers, it's very difficult to understand business. This is my belief. You may not agree with me because you know… All right, let's take a strengths. show of hands. Unless you are very good in numbers, you cannot succeed in business. How many people agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's the majority. What about other things? Uh, what about brand? What about quality? What about innovation? Uh, how many people think that numbers can come afterwards and innovation comes first? Yeah, and innovation. There's one lady, so there, there's, there are two ladies, and, I, and there's one other gentleman. Everybody's sort of struggling to get their hand up because <laughs> they're a minority. Uh, so, um, so if you go to uh, San Francisco today, uh, in Silicon Valley, everybody, nobody talks about numbers. Everybody talks about ideas. Yeah. Everybody talks about innovation. Yeah. Everybody talks about changing the world. Yeah. Numbers, they'll follow. I always say there is one requirement for success, sir. Uh, while this is a strength. For you to be successful, you have to think out of the box and you have to be extremely creative. Yeah. There's no question. Creative, it's not art, it's your business also can be, has to be very creative. Even for managers, see the biggest challenge is we employ about 25,000 people. The biggest challenge for me is to find managers with a creative mind. For any organization of this scale, you know, at the top you cannot take all the decisions, it has to percolate. The pyramid will have to work perfectly at all the levels, all the layers of the pyramid. So I would say that creativity is one of the most important uh, part of anybody's success. But without number, you cannot relate. So one of the things I say about numbers, I'm just playing uh, devil's advocate to ask, ask these questions to draw out this thing. Uh, when I think about numbers uh, and when I have a a balance sheet or an income statement with me. To me, it's all historical. It's already happened. It gives me a good indication, but that's it. It doesn't talk about the future. What are the lead indicators for the future that you look at and think about? Perhaps in numbers, because most numbers I see are historical. See, numbers definitely help you to... What has happened is very important for you to plan your future. See, numbers definitely give you a what exactly has happened? Say a project, a product. What has happened to the product? Say you're selling this product at X price. 
what is the cost, what is the overhead. It's all numbers. And historically, if you are able to capture that management information system, primarily, it is nothing but numbers. Okay. So it gives you a clear idea of how exactly it has historically, what has happened in the past. And then you can, you can systematically, or you can, the strategy can be done only if you have, of course, there are other, other things also. Your gut feeling. 80% of the people, businessmen, they go with their gut feeling. While statistics may help you, I will say that statistics will help you to definitely plan your future, especially from the professional business. But the vision is never with the statistics. It is from the guts. So you feel that, you know, for example, I'll tell you a right example. When I picked up this piece of land, which we are developing in Shobahat land, it's about 183 acres of land. Uh, Dubai uh, real estate business at the point of time was in the low. I had a feeling because I definitely, I, I used to tell my son-in-law all the time, who's sitting here, that, you know, this, this country, when we, we are talking about 2009, when we are really struggling, 2009 I told him, this country can never go down. The enough is already done in this country. Nobody can challenge this country. And it will come back. I'm talking about Dubai. I was 100% confident that Dubai will come back. And 2010, uh, 11 middle we started uh, discussing, 2011 and we concluded the first year. The whole market, I know what I heard from the market, they said this is a big fool who has taken this kind of a decision. Because nobody could believe that the, this was a decision. Probably I will contribute that factor not to numbers, but, but the gut feeling. So gut feeling probably gives you an opportunity and 80% of the time I've seen businessmen, while the numbers are very, very critical, but certain areas, you know, where you really hit the, the thing is your guts. The creative ability and the ability to understand anything without the support of numbers. One of uh, the most famous uh, billionaires in the world who is also a great philanthropist, Warren Buffett, and he also talks about exactly what you just said, that you go against the market. And when the market is down, that is where the greatest opportunities are. Um, have you done, you obviously you gave a recent example, in the past, did you have examples like that? I See, I'll tell you, um, we went to India to do business, real estate business, after many years in the Gulf. I went to India in 1994, it's 20 years ago. I went to about 30 crores rupees, Indian rupees. And um, I used to go, I understood the city. I used to bet on a street. Uh, on a road called Sajapur Road in Bangalore. People used to say that I'm a fool. Even dogs will not go there. So I requested a friend of mine, I don't want to reveal the name, he used to head the finance department of the, one of the largest companies in India. I, they were located in Bangalore. I requested him at that point of time, you got enough of cash. Why don't you buy 100 acres of land on that particular road? So he said, no, this, that, this, that. It was 30 lakhs of rupees. I have to quote in lakhs of rupees now. I can convert that in American yeah, yeah. dollars and give you few, because a lot of <laughs> people may not understand. So See, that's why we, now so, we know where, where he has to have this thing in his pocket. It's $50,000 those days. Um, and it is, it is uh, $50,000 an acre available. 100 acres was available. Today, it is about $5 million an acre. So that's a kind of price difference, you know, but, you know, it went up, it shot up. So I was in that road, always, all my, all my buildings were on that road for many, many years. And actually, I developed that area right. first. And of course, today, it's one of the most expensive areas in the city. I think I, when, when you go to, I think a lot of business people have this strength, mm. that, that unknown, you know, that is an unknown thing. It has no statistics, it has no... You, if you ask me what, what, what exactly could be the reason for you to be in Sajapur Road, you cannot explain. Even now when I go to this thing, I'll say Mysore Road, I will not bet. In Bangalore. Delhi also, I used to say this place is better, that place is better. If you really ask me what exactly is the reason, I do not know. I feel this is the best place. Right. I mean, uh, I think most people, including myself, uh, felt that Medan was too far away. Um, and, and an open space there. Who is going to go there? Uh, a friend of mine, he used to run the IMAX cinema there, and he said, oh, this is, 
it's too far away. I said, it's not. It's about 10 minutes, 12 minutes from Burj Khalifa and Dubai Mall. What are you talking about? 